Chaksur Militan Yena Tesma Shri Gurave Namaha Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachatesha Tadine Panchakaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vaibhav session. We're studying the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, and we're on chapter number 11 today. Chapter number 11 is entitled Lord Krishna's Entrance into Dwarka. Right, I'll share the screen and we'll go to the PowerPoint. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay, let's see. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Nice Vyasa son. Well decorated. Okay, a little review what we covered yesterday. We heard about the ladies in Hastinapur and they were glorifying Lord Krishna and it said the words of the ladies of Hastinapur were more glorious than the hymns of the Vedas. The words of the ladies of Astinapur were also, was also Vedic mantras, bet, or better than even the Vedic mantras. They're giving direct glorification of the Lord. They were personally able to see the form of the Lord there. So directly they were glorifying him. The Vedas glorify the Lord indirectly. By all the Vedas, the Lord is to be known. So these ladies, they had understood the purport of the Vedas. And we spoke about separation from the Lord and the feelings of the residents of Hastinapur, how they were all deeply attached to him and they did not like to see him leave, naturally, very painful to see the Lord leave them. And so they felt that pain of separation, but that separation itself was as good as being with the Lord. So the, the effect of separation was that it invoked the association of the Lord because the mind is fixed on the Lord. Then we spoke about the principles of shyness and the need for gender separation not everybody agrees, not everybody is in favour of these things. Modern society, certainly, the women are in general don't think they should be shy and they also don't like to be separate from each other. But these are very important principles which, which make them make the women actually it increases their attractive nature women become more attractive the more they're shy and the more women are separated when the women mix freely then people think oh, no need to marry you can associate with women all the time 
So we get so many people marry, or even if they do marry, they get divorced, and then they get married again, and like this, because people don't observe these principles. These principles could help so much to solve the problems in the world today. So Dwarka has defeated the glories of the heavenly planets. The heavenly planets are glorified. Oh, everybody's very intelligent, very nice there, no miseries, it's, not so, it's all very comfortable, a lot of sense gratification. But Dwarka defeats the glories of the heavenly planets. Why? Because the people in Dwarka are able to relish the association of the Lord at every moment. The Lord rarely goes to the heavenly planets. The demigods in heaven, very rarely they get to see the Lord. We read about Lord Brahma. When Mother Bhumi was overburdened, she went to Lord Brahma to help her because the planet was overburdened with the demoniac kings. And Lord Brahma went and prayed on the shore of Swetadweep. He didn't, he couldn't go and directly see the Lord. But the people in Dwarka, they can see the Lord at every moment. So that is one of the benefits of being in the Holy Dawn. Now, so an appreciation for residing in the Holy Dawn, we spoke a little bit about it. That you can remember more the past things of the Lord. And in the Holy Dham you will find similar devotees of the Lord who are dead there, they reside there simply to increase their remembrance of the Lord. So it's a very conducive atmosphere for spiritual advancement. And it's said whatever service you do in the Holy Dham, you get many, many more times of benefit than what you get doing service in another place. So very powerful to live in the Holy Dawn and to do service there. And, and then the principles of Lord Krishna's conjugal love. So we spoke a little bit about Lord Krishna's uh, conjugal relationships. There's par Parakya Rasa, Swakya and Parakya. Parakya Bhava is there in Vrindavan with the gopis and Swakya Bhava is there in Dwarka. And Lord Krishna enjoys loving relationships and we heard how he accepted all 16,100 ladies who were considered in terms of modern society, they were considered fallen. But Lord Krishna accepted all of them as his wives and married all of them and gave each one of them a palace also. All right, are there any questions on these uh, points which we covered yesterday on the, the chapter before, chapter number 10? Anybody has any questions? Anyone? No? Okay. Yes? Some, yes, Prabhu? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, my question is in regard, um, in regard to the, the prayers of the women on the roof. So they were saying that the Lord never left his, um, his wives in Dvarka. Uh, I can't remember the exact verse. So, um, but then later we see that, uh, we'll, we'll see in chapter 11 that Krishna comes back to Dvarka and they all come to meet him and they were separated from him. So this seems like a contradiction. His, his wives were separated from him? All of the Dvarka citizens. It, well, it's not mentioned his wives um, uh, specifically. But all the Dvarka citizens came out to meet him and they were very eager to meet him because of uh, a long, long separation. Yes. But in the prayer in Hastinapu, in the prayer of the women on the roofs, they said the Lord never, uh, never left his wives. 
I can find that first if it's necessary. Yeah, maybe you can tell me which verse you're talking about. I need to I need to see the exact verse. Okay, I'm just looking for it. This is uh, chapter 10, verse 30. Verse 30? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe you could just read it for me. despite their being without individuality and without purity. Their husband, the lotus-eyed personality of Godhead, never left them alone at home. He always pleased their hearts by making valuable presentations. Yeah, so these ladies, all these women, auspiciously glorified their lives. So these ladies are the, these ladies who were in the prison of Bomasura. Right? 16,100. That's who's being talked about. Yes. Right? Yes, I, I guess. I, I think he's talking, they're talking about the women of Valka. Well, the, talking about those women who, oh, okay. it's mentioned particularly, they were without individuality and without purity. Okay. So these are, all these women as mentioned in the previous verse the children of these ladies oh, all of these ladies are glorious oh okay that all the all other ladies also were also forcibly taken away by him after he killed Bomasura he's talking about all the wives right but particularly the 16,100 are there all of these ladies are glorious. Their husband, the lotus -eyed, never left them alone at home. Yeah. Well, sometimes he did leave them. He'd go to like Kurukshetra. What, what was your point? So, so, my, so my question was, it seems like a contradiction. It is said that he never left them. But, but he actually did leave them, as you, as you just said, in the Kurukshetra war. Yeah. So, so it seems like a contradiction. That, that is my um, doubt. No. Yeah. Did, did he leave them or did he not leave them? Or maybe both? Well, when he was at home, he enjoyed their company. I think that's the point. That when he was at home, then he would be with them and he enjoyed their company. But not that he was all the time with them. We have to understand it in that sense. Certainly we'll see that he does go. He had to go to Kurukshetra, he has to go and do things. <laughs> yeah? Yes. But, but when, when, when he's at home, he will enjoy their company. All right? Okay, okay Maharaj. Thank you. So we'll go ahead. Is everybody able to see the slide okay?
Okay, so the overview of the chapter, chapter 11, begins with Krishna. We heard how in chapter 10 Krishna was leaving Hastinapur, right? And he was traveling with his entourage. Maharaj Yudhisthira went with him part of the way and then at a certain point Lord Krishna convinced Maharaj Yudhisthira to go back. And Krishna continues with his entourage and they come to Dwarka. And as they're approaching Dwarka, Lord Krishna blows his conch shell. And the people in Dwarka, they're able, they're able to hear the sound of Lord Krishna's conch shell and the citizens all come running, they're eager, they're so happy, they've been waiting for Lord Krishna to return and they all come to greet him. And we'll be hearing today about how they greet him. And when they come to greet him, they offer nice prayers to him. And then the second section, we'll hear about the beauty of Dwarka and the opulence, what it was like. We'll hear about the descriptions of Dwarka and we'll hear also about how the Lord was received and what is the proper reception in greeting the Lord and in greeting some very senior personality. Then Lord Krishna enters into the city and we'll hear how he exchanges affection, different relationships with different people, all kinds of people, and the Lord will reciprocate with them according to their position. Some people he will embrace, some people he will bow before, and some people he will just simply smile at them and wave to them. And then the final section we'll hear about Lord Krishna entering into each of his palaces and we'll hear more about the spiritual nature of Krishna's relationship with his queens. We want to understand carefully this uh, pastime of Lord Krishna having 16,108 queens. We want to know more about their spiritual position. Okay, so the chapter begins. Here you can see in the illustration, Lord Krishna blowing his conch shell. So Lord Krishna is entering into the country of Anartas, which is another name for Dwarka. Maybe some of you have been to Dwarka. Any of you been to Dwarka? Anyone? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Only one. Yes, you've been also? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Any Matijis have been to Dwarka? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay, good. So, you know what Dwarka is like. <laughs> Very, very kind of remote place, right? It's really far away, remote place. Right on the coast, you have to go through all the, past all the salt, salt lakes, where they're making the salt. Finally, you get to Dwarka. Dwarka is right on the coast, so just like in Bombay, if the temple is in, in Bom Mumbai, because Mumbai is near the sea, so the air is very salty. So it's, it's very difficult for them when they make dresses for the deities, because everything corrodes. The salt in the air is very corrosive. And if you use jari on the dresses, then it corrodes. So usually they have to make use, when they make dresses for the deities, they'll do them with beads rather than just using traditionally jari. And also even the marble corrodes, and the marble also corrodes. So you see in Dwarka usually they, they build temples with granite and our little Iskon temple which is built there is also made of granite, granite, because granite won't corrode the same as the marble. Anyway, Lord Krishna, when he was there, his Dwarka was the island. He, he had an island, right? He had the whole island. Big island. Must have been a huge place. 
because so many people were there. Anyway, hearing about it, Sutta Goswami said, Upon reaching the border of his most prosperous metropolis, known as the country of Anartas, Tuarka, the Lord sounded his auspicious conch shell, heralding his arrival and apparently pacifying the dejection of the inhabitants. Yeah, the people of Dwarka were dejected because Lord Krishna was absent from the kingdom. And all these people living in Dwarka, they're all Dambasis. They're very, very nice devotees. And the Lord has gone away, and so they're feeling the absence, they're feeling dejected. So when they hear the conch shell, they become enlivened. So here we have a description now in the second verse from this The white and fat bowl conch shell, being gripped by the hand of Lord Krishna and sounded by him, appeared to be reddened by the touch of his transcendental lips. It seemed that a white swan was playing in the stems of red lotus flowers. The, a white swan was playing in the stems of red lotus flowers. So this example is given here by uh, Sukadeva Goswami, uh, Sutta Goswami, right? Sutta Goswami speaking. This is the first chapter. Sukadeva has not appeared yet. First chapter is Sutta Goswami. So Sutta Goswami is given this example about the white swan. White swan, of course, is the, the conch shell, and the red lotus flowers, the lotus flower, well, the red lips are, of course, the lips of the Lord, and the stem of the lotus flower are the lotus feet of the Lord. So, we remember that example, which is given in relation to, to that famous prayer by Maharaj Kula Shekhar, right? Maharaj Kula Shekhar says, Krishna Tvadiya Padapankaja Panjarantam Ajayva Me Vishatu Manasa Raja Hamsa. Raja Hamsa, the swan. He said, Manasa Raja Hamsa, let the swan of my mind become entangled in the stem of the, the lotus feet of the Lord. And so here also it's the, 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 the stem of the red lotus flowers. So the swan likes to play in the stem of the lotus flowers and sometimes the, the stem of the lotus will become wrapped around the neck of the swan. So here also the, the red lips of the Lord have touched the conch shell and it appears to be, become reddened. So the example is given that everything is actually spiritual. And when it's used in the service of the Lord, then it, it becomes really spiritualized. So the conch shell, when it's sounded by the Lord, is fully transcendental. All of the ornaments, all of the paraphernalia of Lord Krishna are all transcendental. Everything, the incense which we burn is transcendental, the instruments we play are transcendental. It's all meant for Lord Krishna's glorification. And the conch shell also is for glorification. It's for the service of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is announcing his arrival in Dwarka. And the conch shell is becoming transcendental in the hands of the Lord. Right? Sometimes we announce to people, sometimes in order to get an audience, in a, a university or college program, sometimes we'll, we will announce something like, come and see matter made into spirit, right? Something mystical, just to get people's attention. Do you believe matter can be spiritualized? And we'll make a title like that for a talk. And, and so but then we'll show them how when we use something in the service of Krishna, everything becomes spiritual. So this is the nature of devotional service. And the conch shell is certainly transcendental. It's becoming reddened. 
and the touch of Lord Krishna. Prabhupada explains, by ardent love and devotional service to the Lord, or in other words, by spiritual contact with the Lord, everything becomes spiritually reddened, like the conch shell in the grip of the Lord. The Paramahamsa, or the supremely intelligent person, plays the part of the ducking swan in the water of spiritual bliss eternally decorated by the lotus flower of the Lord's feet. So we want to enjoy the lotus flower of the Lord's feet. We want to entangle our mind in the network of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. This is the purpose of devotional service. So here we have this nice artistic representation, Lord Krishna's arrival in Dwarka. <laughs> you can see it's uh, not quite like that today. It's a bit more flatter. They seem to have made it very mountainous there. Eh? Anyway, here's Srila Prabhupada. So Lord Krishna is entering Dwarka. Let me see just a minute. Where's my notes? We want to talk a little bit about Dwarka. Uh, those of you who have been to Dwarka, what are your impressions, you know? Uh, when we hear about a dam coming to, before people come to a holy dam, we tell them, you know, you're going to Vrindavan dam, or you're coming, we're going to go to Dwarka dam, or Mathura dam. Or different Mayapur Dam, Jagannath Puri Dam, there are many Dams. Dam, the Dam is different from a Tirtha. People in the, the Sri Vaishnavas, they talk about Tirthas and there are 108 Tirthas. Tirtha is a, a holy place, but it's not a Dam. The Dam is particularly a powerful place because the Lord resides there eternally. So, Coming to the Dham, sometimes people are a bit shocked, not so much about Dwarka, but when they come to Vrindavan, they may feel shocked. Vrindavan is somewhat primitive. Well, now, of course, it's very congested and it's changed a lot over the years and since Prabhupada's time, so many changes. We used, to, we used to be quite remote there at the Krishna Balaram temple. Practically no one lived up at that end of the town of Vrindavan. People were all down in Loy Bazaar. And sometimes a bus would come by on that road, Krishna Balaram Road, or Bhaktivedanta Swami Marg, that road. And the bus would come by. Not much traffic. Now, oh, it's just... So much change, it's really a big difference. So, how do we, and from the descriptions which are given in the Bhagavatam, we have uh, very nice descriptions actually, the nature of Dwarka, right? How is Dwarka described in the verses in, Srimad, in chapter 11 in Bhagavatam? Is it very pleasing or is it very what how what what did you, what did you think of the descriptions? Are you those of you who have been there, how did you find it? We can ask Mat some Mataji to contribute here.
Can we have some hands? Somebody like to contribute? Yes? Can you put your microphone on? I can't hear you. Very faint. Very faint. I don't know what you're saying, it's not clear. Other people. Oh, you're talking about the inhabitants of Dwarka? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the people were self-hearted and they were very helpful. Okay, that's something unusual. We don't find that usually in a big city. Right? We want, we want to compare the, the description of Dwarka as it's given here in the Bhagavatam and a modern-day metropolis. How do they compare? Another point uh, which was mentioned is uh, that architecture of the temples uh, was very uh, nice, very, very attractive and very nice. The arti? Architecture. Oh, the architecture of the temples. Oh, okay. The, not a great number of temples there, few temples. It's not a very big place today, Dwarka. The way it's described in Srimad Bhagavatam, very big. They talk about highways <laughs> and 16,108 palaces for Krishna's queens. So was, that's certainly very different. But the description given in Bhagavatam, the description of Dwarka, filled with opulences. Sorry? Filled with opulences of all seasons. Okay, opulences of all seasons. Gardens. Yes. Flower gar gardens, orchards, ashrams, lakes. There were many different birds. No factories. Yes. Prabhupada talks about that. The, in the modern metropolis, people live in slums. Sometime back I was in New Delhi and I saw that they had a sign on the roadside that said, Old Slum, and then another sign said, New Slum. You know, I was surprised, you know, they, they, they actually put the sign up which said old slum and then new slum. And so this is modern day metropolis. People have to live in slums. They have to live in horrible environments and they have to work in horrible atmospheres in factories and mills. 
just to fill their belly, just to get some money to fill their belly. But actually, the Vedic way of life is to live off the land. Of course, people, they may say they have no land. They may not have any land. So they come to the city looking for work. But there's a lot of work in the countryside. If they will work, they can work in the countryside. They don't need to stay and come to the city to work. There's a lot of, they, they need people to work. Sometimes in the villages nowadays, they don't have enough workers to plant the rice. They don't have people to do all the work that, which they're supposed to do in the countryside to produce the food. Everyone's gone off to the city, to work in the cities, to work in the factories, or to get some office job. Nobody wants to do the honest work which the farmer will do, the simple work of working the land, taking care of cows. So Dwarka was uh, the, the ideal place, it was very pleasing to the mind when you go to such a place where nature is respected and where nature is given a chance to provide proper facilities and uh, to nature is not disturbed by the industrial environment, then the mind feels so much more peaceful. And Prabhupada talks about how the big, the big wealthy men, those who have big positions and power, they like to come to the countryside. When they get time, when they get free time, they will come, they have their countryside home and they will live there. We see here in Navadweep Dam, in Navadweep Dam, when we go on Parikrama, we go to visit different parts of Navadweep Dam, and many places we will see there are big houses there which are all locked up, deserted. And the people who own the houses, they've gone off to Delhi or Mumbai or Calcutta, and they keep their home there and they just lock it up and they go away. They don't like to live there. But they have the house. They have the house, they own land there, but they go off to the city. They want to live in the city. Just like all the rats and cockroaches, they all like to go in these dirty, crowded places. So the same way people go and come, they go to the city and they live in some apartment building, packed in, in some apartment building, so many people on top of each other, and you look out the window and you look into another person's apartment, everything's all so packed and crowded together, no proper air, the air's all polluted by the traffic and the congestion, and the it's very dangerous also, there's so much crime, robberies. But in a place like Dwarka, you're more safe. In this holy dam, there's a spiritual atmosphere and you can feel the, the natural beauty of the place. It's very easy to appreciate the natural beauty. Just like when you go to Govardhan, you go around Govardhan, you can see the beauty of Govardhan. Nowadays they're restoring many of the places around the Govardhan, it's becoming more and more beautiful, restoring it back to its original nature. So the, the holy land of Dwarka, very special place. So Lord Krishna has come back there and we're going to, then we, we go on to hear about the, re, the reception, how the people, they all come out to greet him and 
Prabhupada talks about how to properly receive the honoured guest. Described here, the Vedic way of receiving a great personality creates an atmosphere of respect which is saturated with affection and veneration for the person received. The auspicious atmosphere of such a reception depends on the paraphernalia described above. Such a program of reception is full of sincerity on the path on the part of both the receiver and the received. All right, so you have to receive a great personality. Prabhupada is coming, right? In the picture you can see a reception, Srila Prabhupada's come. So, what are you going to do? You, you can see Prabhupada's got a big garland, they must have given Prabhupada a garland. They're holding an umbrella over his head. Any other things you'd like to do when you have to receive a, a, a Srila Prabhupada? Or Srila Prabhupada is coming? Or Srila Prabhupada's representative is going to come? How are you going to welcome them? What is the proper arrangements for the uh, reception of an honoured guest? Can we have some hands up? Yes? Who's got their hand up? Sachitanai Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, when Prabhupada or followers of Prabhupada come, we usually chant the holy name of the Lord, sing, and welcome him with garland and with proper. Okay, so you're going to do kirtan, you said? A anything else which I didn't mention? I mentioned about the umbrella and the flower garlands. Anything else you're going to do to make the proper reception? Somebody? Krishna, yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, I was thinking sometimes when such personalities arrive, uh, at the destination, then we would do Guru Puja sometimes and uh, do foot bathing. Pada Puja, yes. Yes. Sometimes, yes, Prabhupada uh, allowed devotees to do that for him. He said, when, when the devotees did it the first time, he said, Oh, you are learning. Prabhupada hadn't told them to do it, but the, as the devotees were reading the books, they were understanding more what is the proper standard of reception. However, you have to be careful about this. In some parts of the world, that this is a dangerous thing. You know, like if, if you go to some countries where there's maybe a communist country, you know, where people are, or a socialist country, people are not in favour of this... Uh, Worship of men. Worship of men is not encouraged, it's not appreciated. And they will, sometimes they will, people will take great, they'll make criticism, they really become offended by it. They don't, like, they will criticize it. They say, look at this. It's an, um, you know, they don't recognize that this is a great personality. So we have to be a bit careful about doing these kind of functions like offering worship and bathing the feet, these kind of things. Where it's the culture here in India, it's not recognized in other countries often and it's difficult for people to understand and they may, they may criticize it. So 
we are, we, in some, some parts of the world we are very careful about this. But some other things which can be done? Yes, Maharaj. We, we also used to sometimes uh, shower the flower on the personality when we can. Yes. Scatter some flowers on the heads, fr maybe from above, like. Yeah, yeah we have such we have, uh, windows uh, on the up the way how is going to the temple, so we used to uh, show flowers on the rooms. Yes, like, uh, right. And you, we read about Krishna's wives, they're up on the roof of the palaces, they also throw flowers down onto Lord Krishna. Okay, something else? Yes. Can you say again? Offering Karnamrit and offering uh, Mahaprasad and uh, offering humble obeisances. Yes. First, you want to offer the obeisances. Yes. And then Charanamrit. Where are you going to get the Charanamrit from? We will, uh, we will arrange it from the temple beforehand. Well, usually that would be done at, at the temple. When you go to see the deity, after seeing the deity, then you take Charanamrita. It's, okay. it's not customary to bring the Charanamrita to give him just at the airport or something. That's not done. But at the temple, after seeing the deity, then you take Charanamrita. But, but Mahaprasadam, that can be done. That, that should be done. There should be distribution of food. It's, that's a very important element in the reception, that there must be the distri distribution of prasadam to people. I remember when Prabhupada came one time in New York, we prepared a big plate of fruit for Prabhupada. Prabhupada liked fruit, actually, and uh, when he saw the fruit, you know, he took a piece of watermelon. Prabhupada liked very much watermelon. He took some watermelon. And then after Prabhupada had taken something, then he said, distribute. So like that, we offer first to the great personality, and then he, his remnants, whatever should be all this, there should be food prasadam distribution. Prasadam distribution is a very, very important part of the reception of a, an, a big guest. And then, of course, there will be also words of praise and welcome. And when Prabhupada would come, just like you can see Prabhupada, there's a film recording of it, Prabhupada coming into Delhi, coming back from America, and they, some of his disciples had already come there, and they brought the mayor, and they brought other important men, big politicians, to come and meet Prabhupada. So when, when you have that opportunity, if you have that recognition from the local authorities, then you can also get leaders of society like statesmen and government leaders and um, dignitaries to come and to meet Prabhupada and to greet him. And we would do like that. And Prabhupada would appreciate that very much. And he liked that also at, at the, when he was residing at the temple. He would like to meet and to discuss with important men. While Prabhupada was in London, we would be, bring different people to meet him. Sometimes, you know, famous 
statesmen from the past, or sometimes sportsmen, and sometimes entertainers, different people, but prominent people, well-known people, and Prabhupada would enjoy to talk with them. Uh, so, so like this, how to make a nice reception for the pleasure of the Lord and for the Lord's devotees. So in, in this regard, we also talk about uh, festivals which take place in the temple, right? Let's go ahead. Oh, one, one important part we didn't discuss was about those people who came to greet the Lord when he arrived at Dwarka. And among those people who were there, right, maybe you remember who was all there, among the different people who came to greet Lord Krishna when he arrives at Dwarka were the prostitutes. And the, these pro it's described here, I'll just read it. It appears that the prostitutes of Dwarka, who were so eager to meet the Lord, were all his unalloyed devotees. And thus they were all on the path of salvation, according to the above version of the Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, the only reformation that is necessary in society is to make an organized effort to turn the citizens into devotees of the Lord. And thus all good qualities of the denizens of heaven will overtake them in their own way. Alright, so there were many different people who all came to greet Lord Krishna. It's described and it particularly mentions about these ladies who were the prostitutes of Dwarka. And they're described as being very beautiful. Their beautiful faces with dazzling earrings, and, you know. So, how can we uh, understand this, of course, is bewildering for ordinary people to think that Dwarka is a dam, a holy place, and in the holy place there are prostitutes? What is this? First of all, who could who can respond to this? Hmm? How is it possible there could be prostitutes in a holy dam? Anybody would like to take up this end, this subject matter? Respond to it? Murli Manohar? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I was, I was just thinking that um, the quality of the persons at that time were, were underlying uh, much more dharmic and um, so much more dharmic. So even though they may have had um, occupations like a prostitute, they were probably more of substantial character than the people in Kali Yuga. So they could, um, they were probably could be in that occupation, but they would still remain devoted to the Supreme Lord. The underlying character of people in that age were much more better than it is now. Now such prostitutes today are very, very degraded. Very, very um, unpleasant <laughs> and degraded. But in that time, because uh, it was more, it was more dynamic atmosphere. Even if they had that occupations of prostitute, they were still somewhat, um, I would say, somewhat civilized. That's one, one fault. Okay. Yes, I appreciate this point. Yes, that certainly today it's a, a very different business. That uh, first of all, these ladies. Although they're prostitutes and they're engaged in this uh, unpleasant business, Srila Prabhupada explains, he says, sometimes just due to some unfortunate circumstance, 
a woman may be put into that position that she has to take up this kind of engagement in order to maintain her life. And Prabhupada then also explains that there will be a class of men who are fallen and who, for this fallen kind of man, the one wife at home is not enough to satisfy his senses, that he has to go to other women. And in order for this purpose, in order to satisfy this fallen man's senses, the class of women there are there, they, they are prostitutes. And it, Prabhupada explains it's better that there are prostitutes in the society, in those circumstances. Otherwise a man, this fallen man who is going woman hunting, he may seduce innocent women and he may induce other women into the prostitution business. So it's better that there are women who are actually engaged in this way as prostitutes rather than allowing chaste women and uh, women who are uh, have some purity to be degraded. And we have to understand that this kind of need is there among people, certain fallen people in the world today. So, in 5,000 years ago it was like that, but as uh, Murli Manohar Prabhu is saying, the prostitutes in those days were more dharmic, in other words, they knew who their customer was. And they were not out there to seduce any man, to just think, whoever's got money, come and be my customer, the way it is to today. But 5,000 years ago, these women who were prostitutes, they knew their customer, they knew the, the particular man who was their customer. And at the same time, they're devotees. And they're described as unalloyed devotees. They really love Krishna. And that's why they've come to greet Krishna when the Lord has come. They've all come to greet Him. They're just unfortunate. So, how to understand it? it it's mentioned, they were all on the path of salvation according to the above version of the Bhagavad Gita. Right? What, which verse in the Bhagavad Gita is the, being described? Is it um, Apichet Surajato Padachayam Anandipa? Sadeva Mantavya Samyak Vyasato Hisha. Even if one commits the most abominable actions, if they're, they're sort of considered saintly if they're rendering devotional service. Could that be it? Well, I think it might be another one. I thought I was thinking of Striyo Vaishyas Tata Sudras Tepi Yanti Param Gatim. Yeah, that of, yeah, that's correct, Maharaj. Of course, yes. Thank you. Even though one may be of lower birth, women, Sudra or Vaishya, they can attain the supreme destination because they are rightly situated. So these prostitutes are on the path of salvation. They're not very happy doing that work, but they have to do it. They have to maintain themselves somehow due to unfortunate circumstances. They're put into that position. But at the same time, they're devotees and they're cultivating the mood of love for the Lord. And by doing devotional service, gradually they will become purified. They will become purified. Uh, Prabhupada writes that devotional service does not depend on one's occupation or birth or social position. Anybody can take up devotional service from any position. It doesn't depend on your occupation. And so they have this unfortunate occupation, but they're devotees. So the important point is to encourage people in their devotion. I was thinking an another example, Prabhupada went to Jakarta, Indonesia. And when he was there, he met this one man, Indian man. The man said, I love Krishna Swamiji, but I also love wine. So Prabhupada told him, 
So when you drink your wine, you should think this wine, this is the taste of Krishna. He said, you just think like that. Every time you're drinking wine, you just remember this wine is the taste of Krishna. And in this way you become purified. And gradually, as they get purified, they will be able to give up their sinful activities. So Prabhupada states here, the only reformation that is necessary in society is to make an organized effort to turn the citizens into devotees of the Lord. And thus, all good qualities of the denizens will overtake them. So somehow get people to become devotees. The rules and regulations come later. Just get people to become devotees. This is the principle in preaching Krishna consciousness, right? Don't worry about the rules and regulations. Get people to be devotees. And these prostitutes, they had devotion. They all came to meet Lord Krishna, to welcome him. And they're eager to see the Lord. On the other hand, those who are non-devotees have no good qualification whatsoever. However, they may be materially advanced. The difference is that the devotees of the Lord are on the path of liberation, whereas the non-devotees are on the path of further entanglement in material bondage. Right? Uh, this this uh, statement here, Prabhupada is basing on that the, the verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, which describes that one who is a devotee of the Lord has all good qualities. Yashyasti bhaktir bhagavati akinchana sarvayar gunaistatra samasi suraha. Right? One who is a devotee has all good qualities. One who is not a devotee, even though he may be very expert in controlling his senses, he's very expert in raising his family, he's very expert in mystic yoga, but if he's not a devotee, he doesn't have any good qualities because he's under the modes of nature and he's just going to remain under the modes of nature. But one who is a devotee, he will transcend the modes of nature. Prabhupada had the experience, he went into the post office one time in India and the man in the post office was talking to Prabhupada and the man in the post office said, why I have to be a devotee? Why? He said, I'm a good man, I'm honest, I don't steal, I don't lie, I don't cheat. But Prabhupada said, no, if you're not a devotee, sometimes you will do these things, sometimes you will. You're under the modes of nature, sometimes you're in goodness, nature of the mode of goodness is sometimes passion, sometimes ignorance. You cannot avoid it. If you're not a devotee, you really don't have any good qualities. It's just a question of time. Sometimes some good qualities, other times bad qualities. But one who is actually a devotee, they're on the path of liberation. So these prostitutes, even though they're in that unfortunate occupation, they're devotees and they're going to get advanced. And re remember, they're devotees in the Holy Dham. Of course, is it good that they're doing this business in the Holy Dham? Well, I don't know. We have to consider. What is their consciousness? They're maybe more attached to being in the Holy Dham then they are attached to being prostitutes. They don't want to leave the Holy Dham because in the Holy Dham they've got the opportunity to see Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is coming. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Anybody else like to contribute about the prostitutes in Dwarka? Yes? Question. Yes. Um, it seems to me that um, the prostitutes uh, were were more closer to Krishna um, when they meet him on the street um, than the chaste women who were on the roofs. 
uh, on buildings and this seems to me a little bit unfair or um, why why they were on the streets and they were like they weren't like uh, the chaste women Yes, it's an interesting point, Mariji. Thank you. You brought up yes. The, 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 we do hear about the chaste ladies, like Krishna's wives, and so on. They're described to be on the the roof of their buildings. They didn't come down on the street. And Prabhupada talks about it, how they observed uh, the se segregation of the genders. They showed the shyness because they were cultured, respectable ladies. So they didn't go out on the street with the mass of people. Well, because their homes were there, they could actually see the Lord coming there. But for the other prostitutes, you know, the Lord is not going to come to their home. He's not going to go there where they live. They went to see the Lord. So they didn't have that facility, they didn't have the, the rooftop house where they could go to actually see the Lord. They had to just be there on the street. But, of course, they would observe some segregation. They wouldn't be able to directly go and to be close to the Lord. They would, be, they would keep some distance back. That would be observed. That's the custom that the ladies will they will see the Lord from the distance, although they're not able to go on the roof. But the other ladies, those queens of Dwarka, they can go on their rooftop and they can welcome the, they can see the Lord coming from there. That's how I understand it, anyway. Hmm? Anybody else? Any other comments? Maharaj, I have one. Yes, Prabhu. It's, it's, a, it's a question. Yes. Uh, it's kind of, um, in one sense, surprising that in such a holy environment um, that they're such a transcendentally um, surcharged environment that there is even a need for prostitutes you know i understand in general the point you know of the need for prostitutes so that lusty men won't induce proper cultured ladies into you know their entanglement but it just seems odd you know that there would be a need for them in dwarka that's the question <laughs> or the other well, we have, to, we have to consider how big is Dwarka. You know, it's not that, it, it's not like everybody is just only Krishna and Krishna's family and Krishna's devotees. There's a lot of other people there in Dwarka. And it's described in the, in the chapter, it also mentions the different people who all come out to greet Lord Krishna, right? There were musicians and dancers and singers, actors, there was geologists, uh, geologi uh, geologists, is it? Yeah, yeah, geologists and so, so many different people, different scholars and pundits and so many people were there. It was really a city because so many people, big, and Krishna had a huge family you know, 16,000 wives and each wife has 10 children and then there's so many brahmanas and pundits there and so many other people. It, you know, it's a huge metropolis, right? But still it was very beautiful. Even though there were so many people, still it kept the beauty. The, the, the beauty of Dwarka was maintained. It didn't become an industrial hell. So... The atmosphere was good, but there's a lot of people, a lot of different people needed. And, you know, there has to be also teachers and shopkeepers and cooks and all different people cleaning and doing things. We heard about when Lord Krishna is coming, 
they have to, they, everything is kept very clean and they sprinkle the streets with water, fragrant water, which is already, uh, they put the aroma, of, they put some flower petals into the water, so that the water is very fragrant. And they've used this water to wash the streets. And so everything is so pure and sanctified. But there's a lot of people to do all of this. You've got all the workers doing all of this. And not everybody's going to be the pure devotee. This is the point. Not everybody is a pure devotee there in Dwarka. Just like we know in Vrindavan, Vrindavan is a holy place, but you've got all kinds of people. You know, well, here in Mayapur, we know what goes on. We just had a murder here in Mayapur. So you've got, you've got mafia and that kind of thing here in the holy place. Although it's a holy place, and there's a lot of people, but there's all, there's, there's, different kinds of people. So you do have the, the, that problem. You have people who are fallen. They have material desires. Even though they may have some devotion, they like to be in the holy place, but they ha they're fallen souls. They can't control their senses. That's not enough just to have the wife. They, they get more in job. They, they, the, they want to go to the prostitute. Kavi Chandraswami told me about Japan. He said in Japan, he said, the Japanese woman, you know, the, the, the men, they just feel so uncomfortable with their wives at home because the, their wife is at home, you know, she's always nagging, always on their case and complaining to the husband. So the men, the Japanese men, they, they, they like to go to prostitutes also. Although they have a nice wife, well, the wife is nice, but at the same time she talks. You know, women can talk harshly sometimes. You know, and Prabhupada writes, he said, the tongue of a woman is so sharp it can cut you to pieces, will cut your heart to pieces. And so they can talk sometimes very harsh, so the men, just to get away from their wife, they go to prostitutes and, the, you know, they go to the prostitute and the prostitute will joke with them and, you know, they have a, diff it's a very different company being with the prostitute. So even though the man is married, he's not, he, he goes to the prostitute for his sense gratification. So even though the man, he's a bit pious, he's living in the holy place and he's a devotee to some extent, but he can't follow the principles. He's not strict. And this is why you have things like prostitutes in a big city, a big place like Dwarka. That's how I would understand it. Yeah? Is that all right? Yeah. People just have to get away from their wives sometimes. <laughs> okay. So, the Lord is coming. It's like a festival. Uh, so, in Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada goes on to discuss about the, how the Lord is coming and everybody's out there in the streets and there's kirtan and the different musicians are coming and they're performing and everything. It's really a festival because the, the Lord, is he, the Lord of Dwarka has come. And so everybody comes to greet him and not only the prostitutes, but all the musicians and the entertainers and the dancers and everyone. And so it's a festival. So festivi festivities in the temple of the Lord as held generally, are like festivals performed during the manifestive days of the Lord of Dwarka. Just like when Krishna was present, it was a festival. So the same way with the deity, it, Prabhupada explains, this is why the, the Acharyas will install deities in the temple. And in this way they will have also festivals. They will recreate the festival of the Lord appearing, the Lord coming into the Holy Dham. 
and we have these nice festivals. You have festivals like Julan Yatra and Janmastami, these kind of festivals. Authorized acharyas install such temples of the Lord under regulative principles just to offer facilities to the common man. People, you know, the Lord appeared 5,000 years ago, but we get the taste of the Lord appearing when we go to celebrate Janmastami. We go there, we see, you know, we bathe the deity of Lord Krishna. It's, it's a festival, it's a wonderful festival. Or Julan Yatra, you put the Lord on the swing, you pull the swing. Damodar Leela, that's also another festival. Damodar, uh, the month of Damodar, where we offer the lamps every day and sing Damodar prayers. These kind of festivals, they help us to feel the, the presence of the Lord by these festivals. Just as 5,000 years ago the devotees performed these in the presence of the Lord, we can feel the Lord present today in the deity form. The deity is also the form of the Lord. It's not different from the Lord. It's also Archa Vigraha. It's the Lord's internal potency. He appears different incarnations and the deity is one of his incarnations. We have to worship the deity in the proper way. So we, everybody's taking part in festivals. We, are, we, we know coming soon, Gorpunima festival, Nityananda, Triodasi also, and these festivals. They attract many people. If you go to Eka Chakra at the time of Nityananda, Triodasi, big crowds, so many people. And they want to worship the Lord. So this is the mercy of the Acharyas. We open the temple, build the temple, and we want to, you have to celebrate these festivals. If you don't celebrate the festival, it's a great offense. We saw last year, because of the COVID virus, there was no public Rathiatra. But still, the, poor, the pundits at Jagannath Puri, they got permission to celebrate the festival. And they did Rathiatra with no people present. But still, they pulled the chariot all the way to Gundicha and back. They did the festival just as they do every year. They got the permission to do it. So very important to observe these festivals. And certainly a lot of spiritual purification, powerful spiritual atmosphere. You go to these festivals, you can really feel the presence of the Lord. All right, so Lord Krishna has come into Dwarka. And in Dwarka, of course, he has all of his queens. So, who are these queens? We see here, purport of text 37. Queens were also expansions of his internal potency. And thus, the potent and potencies are perpetually exchanging transcendental pleasure known as pastimes of the Lord. All right, so maybe you can, uh, we can make some groups and you can just spend some time to go through this final section and tell us something more. Give us the nature of Lord Krishna and his queen's relationship in Dwarka. We want to understand how Lord Krishna's pastimes with his queens are not of this material world. And what are, how can, how can we present the fact that Lord Krishna had 16,108 queens? How can we present this, this fact to an audience of people who are not devotees. 
how will be how can we be how can we properly present it to them so that they can understand Lord Krishna's pastime in Dwarka? How would you be able to, how would you like, what points would you like to present? We'll put you in groups and you can discuss how we can present Lord Krishna's pastime of having 16,108 queens. How can we present this fact to a modern day audience who are not very much devoted? Is it clear? Prabhu is there? Parmasunari's husband? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. So you make the groups, Prabhu? Yeah. How many groups uh, you want to create? Maharaj? How many devotees we have? It is a 23. So six people a group? Six, okay. four, so 24. How, how much time? 10 minutes. What's the doubt? Yes, what's the doubt? What's it what's he asking? What are they what? I can't. What verses do you want each group to focus on, or do we all do the same ones? Yeah, you all do the. Yeah, okay, well, uh, there are different verses. There's a lot of verses, right? It's between 30 to 39. So we've got six groups. So group one can take text 30, 31, and 31 and 30. Group one and two, 31 and 32. And group three and four can take uh, 33, 34, 35, 36 and, and group 5 and 6 will take 37, 38, 39. Okay. Shall I create a group, Maharaj? Yes, please. Yes. Is it from verse number 30 to 39 or 36 to 39? 36 to 39. 36 to 39. Uh -huh. Yeah, please accept your groups.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Have you able? Are you able to come up with something? You got some points. Still reading, yeah. But uh, what, what I had, uh, the question was so that uh, how we should present it to the common people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right? So uh, in the text uh, 31, there is uh, the omnipotency of the Lord described and uh, how He was expanded in different forms that he was not just uh, not able to take care about the, the queens, but he was expanded in 16,000 forms. And uh, uh, in this way, he also made for every uh, queen a palace and uh, like this. So <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Lord Krishna is taking care of everyone. He's not neglectful. He's not neglectful of duty as a husband, right? The duty of the husband is to provide for the wife, so he provides a palace for each of them. And we have to we have to present that this is God. We're talking about God. We're not talking about an ordinary person. We have to understand what is the, the nature of God. He's the Supreme Lord. He's above everyone. But, but he appears like an ordinary person. So that's, a, the, the, that's a, the, the difficulty that we're thinking him to be ordinary, but he's not ordinary. He's mentioned there in 31 that he's above everyone. He's not equal to or less than anyone. He's way far above everyone. So... This is the point people have to understand. I think that's the main point you want to impress upon people, that there is somebody above everyone much greater than all others. That's clearly stated in 31. As Prabhupada mentioned that, that he can have 16 million uh, wives, not only Right, right, yeah, yeah. Okay. You've got some good points there then. I'll leave you with it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, have you got some points, Mariji? Amala Manjari Mariji? Amala Manjari Mariji? Hare Krishna, Amala Manjari Mariji, Hare Krishna? Are you working on it on your own? Is anybody help working with you? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Other, we said we will read and then... Okay, you read first and then... Okay. Yes, yes, you don't have a lot of time. Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. I can't hear you. You're muted. We are reading and coming back for a discussion after five minutes. Maharaj. Okay, okay. So I'll leave you to it. The 
same thing in text 39 of us seem to be making that emphasis how the laws associated with the transcendental yeah. they're part of his internal potency Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Are you okay? You, you got some good points here. It takes 39 has a lot of points there. Yes, we're, yeah, we're, we're kind of each dealing with one of the verses, Maharaj, one of the purples. So okay. Quite a few points there. We are might, and what we might do is when we present, we just quickly present each, each verse, like one devotee will do each verse. <laughs> <laughs> just try to get the essence, you know, okay. Okay. try to keep it, you know, not too long because we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Try to get the essence, put constant, you know, bring it together if you can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna, have you started meeting yet? Amala Manjari, what's happening? Yes, Maharaj. You're meeting now? Discussing? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj, we'll start now, Maharaj. Yeah, you should start now, please. You haven't got much time. You're supposed to read the text before you come. Krishna appeared on this planet. Um, so, 
appears by his internal potency and um, the, yeah and then krishna says this material world is difficult to overcome but we have to take shelter of krishna only then we can cross over so the queens of dwarata they have taken shelter of krishna and this was after long time of pious activities and many penances that they have got this uh, opportunity to become the lord's uh, wife and they have uh, there's a perfection of their devotional service proper says mm, yes and uh, so it is um, so krishna's marriage is not mundane nor limited by our experience in the conditioned state so even though the wives look like mundane women they are all transcendentally liberated souls and perfect manifestations of internal energy and then 36 even though the, uh, the queens of dwaraka were the very beautiful and even cupid will get attracted krishna was not affected krishna's krishna was not under their control even if he looked are we are we told the identity of these queens are we told about who they are Did you get that? Did it mention there in that section? Who are these queens? You said Krishna was the internal potency. Krishna. I think the queens are also the internal also potency. Internal potency, yes. Yeah, eternally related with him as transcendental wives. And. Yeah, okay. Good. Yes. Okay. So, oh, oh, thank you. I'll oh, just leave it. All right, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Hare Bob, Parmasundari's husband. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Shall close the door? Yeah, close. Close now. Okay, everyone back now? Yeah. All right, so let's hear from group one. Who's going to be the spokesman for group one? Tundrika Mataji. Tundrika Mataji, yeah. Chandrika Maharaj What's happening? Okay, I can say she's not there. Okay, go ahead, Marari Prabhu. Yeah. yeah so, so one point was that uh, the omnipotency of the Lord, that the uh, Lord had uh, made for the all queens, uh, the 16,000 of palaces, which were fulfilling all the desires. So, uh, 
Tomato czy chicken continue? No, no, please probably you continue because uh, something happened with my internet and uh, I just came now. I didn't know what what, what to say. So, okay. uh, so, so the Lord uh, uh, make for all the all the queens the the palaces which are fulfilling all their desires. So, in this way, Lord is taking care of all of them. Not just like in uh, these days when men have some uh, more men, women, so they put them in one place, and uh, he was taking care about all of them, and uh, also uh, he was he's now as Yogeshwar, so he he was able to expand himself in sixteen thousand forms, not just ordinary yogi can expand maximum in uh, eight forms. So this is the only potential of the Lord and uh, uh, we should understand that he is not an uh, ordinary living being like ours. Are, even if he, if he seems like that. So th this was the main point. And then also um, it was described that uh, the Lord uh, is uh, uh, is the original or the or the only enjoyer is a male, and uh, all living beings are females. So, so that we we can have we can be happy only when uh, when we uh, when we are engaged in the in the service of the Lord, uh, because this is the nature of this world is. Uh, is not uh, not satisfying us. So, in the service of the Lord, we can be full, uh, fully satisfied. So, uh, like the queens of the uh, of the Dvaraka. So. All right. Okay. So the the Lord is. Uh able to expand himself, he can maintain each of every lady, gives a palace for each and every one of them, and he expands himself. Did he marry each of every lady? Yes. How did he do that? Yeah, he, he was, uh, he, he had, uh, with every um, queen, he had separate marriage. All at the same time. No, not all at the same time. He married uh, each uh, queen separately. The sixteen thousand queens all married separately. Yes. No, no, no. That's not right. Uh -huh. No, he expanded. Uh -huh. He expanded himself sixteen thousand one hundred times. So he at all at the same time each. Not only did he expand himself, Vasudeva and Devaki also expanded themselves, and they came to each of the marriages. Yeah, I was thinking like that. Sorry, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he he fulfilled all of the duties of a husband, married properly according to the religious principles, and. Uh, <laughs> Provided homes for them, maintains them. Okay, inconceivable, yes. But we have to hear. What is inconceivable to our mind and senses can be understood by hearing. Okay, we'll go on to group two. Can we have somebody from group two? Who is the spokesman? Yes, Prabhu. The main point is that God is great. And we should not assume that we are, he's not one of us. And the measure, the, the potencies of the Lord are unlimited. It is not compared to our potencies. And for, in order to impress that God is great in the history of the human being, on the surface of the earth, he has manifested his potency by uh, showing the marrying uh, 16,000 monthly right wives. And also, to show how his greatness is, though he can manifest into unlimited, uh, unlimited and many, many fold millions of wives, 
but just to just in 2000 just a very fraction of this potency another point is krishna is called a yogeshwara a normal yogi can only manifest into tenfold expansion of his body but lord can expand into many thousands or infinitely there is no limit for his expansion and the relationship between the queens and the krishna but it is not a, on the material platform it's a transcendental it's always transcendental platform. and we cannot imagine or estimate the greatness of the lord with our tiny uh, brain it is it is beyond our is unlimited and beyond our uh, in, uh, beyond our uh, imagination how greatness is and lord can marry many more with his uh, with his potency Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Very nice presentation. Very fine. All right, let's hear from group number three. We heard here uh, from group one and two, they explained how the Lord has inconceivable potencies, potencies beyond our mind and senses. And we heard about how he did, how he showed that by his marrying so many ladies and providing a palace for each of them. All right, group three, who's going to be the spokesman? Is it Gopal Ganesham? Sri Ram Nita Prabhu, I think he's going to do it. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, on behalf of group three, and the identity of the queens of uh, Dwaraka revealed, just mentioned the, the, the internal potencies of the Lord. So in that sense, the Lord has been enjoying with the internal potency, but whereas for the Buddhian people it is appearing like a Buddhian affair. And the, the women's beauty are revealed here. The women of Dwaraka are more attractive, that uh, they even attract the, the Cupid. But uh, Krishna is not so attracted to them. And one more point is, uh, the attraction between them is always ever fresh. and. Uh, they never get bored on seeing the same lotus feet again and again. And uh, they always have a newer feeling on looking at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And uh, these women have attained their position uh, because of long periods of uh, austerities. And uh, this is a perfection of their austerities. So it was the position of the queen's uh, attraction to the Lord. And the Lord had 16,108 palaces, different palaces for each of them, which is not possible for a normal human being. <laughs> yeah. So, very interesting, you're describing to us, these women, they did austerities for many lifetimes in order to get that position of becoming queens of Krishna. And as queens of Lord Krishna, Sometimes they, would, they will smile, use their womenly charm, women smile and they'll move in different ways to attract the mind of their husband. But although Cupid would be bewildered seeing the beauty of these queens, Lord Krishna's mind was never bewildered. Actually Bhagavatam said even sober-minded Lord Shiva would be bewildered by the beauty of these queens and by their movements. But Lord Krishna was always controlled. He was always peaceful and happy, calm. And he was never, con he was never controlled by these women. He didn't allow himself to, become, to come under their control. He is the controller of everyone. And these ladies are his, as we heard in the previous, uh, as Prabhu said, these women are, they're the Prakriti. He is the Purusha, and they are the Prakriti, they are the feminine, they are his energy, they are for his enjoyment. But Lord Krishna is not controlled, he doesn't allow himself to become degraded by them. All right, thank you Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Group number four. Pranams Maharaj, this is Virabha us. So most of the points have already been covered. Uh, I, we can just say that the Lord is the genuine proprietor and enjoyer of everything manifested in his creation. Prabhupada's words, 
However, we are deluded, uh, controlled by the three most major emotions. Or we cannot understand uh, the the leela of of Krishna. Um, th this is one additional point. The rest of the points have already been mentioned, Maharaj. Uh, Lord is Atmaran, he is self-satisfied. Uh, so therefore the relationship was not based on mundane, uh, uh, mundane aspects that we consider to be. So uh, these were these some additional points, Maharaj. Yeah, this is very nice. The, the Lord is Atmarama. Atmarama, one who is satisfied in the Self. So he doesn't need anything for his pleasure. But at the same time, everything is his. It's all his. The whole material creation is his. So he has nothing to possess because it's already his. So because he's Atmarama, he's fully satisfied. He's not thinking, oh, I will enjoy, oh, this, this looks nice. Or, he's not controlled by the mind and senses as we are, we conditioned souls. The Lord is always transcendental. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Let's hear group five. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, Maharaj, it's from uh, last three sloka, 37, 38, 39. Uh, first important point uh, which uh, group identified that uh, here, uh, out of the five rasa, the fifth rasa, the love, and that is husband-wife relationship, that is demonstrated between Krishna and wives of Krishna. Second thing, you are, uh, in, in, in 38 sloka, it is told that as Krishna is unaffected by material nature, his surrendered devotees are also unaffected by the material nature. So both are uh, unaffected by material nature. But third point, uh, on the same time, due to the internal potency, uh, these wives forget that Krishna is the Supreme Personality. They think that uh, Krishna is our beloved uh, husband who just uh, follow what we say, accept whatever we uh, want to uh, him to accept. So that is the beautiful relationship due to the internal uh, potency. And uh, on the second part of the question that how uh, people, uh, uh, we can tell the known devotees. So uh, here, Srila Prabhupada in purport say that uh, foolish people due to their poor fund of knowledge, they accept one side of picture, but they don't accept the second side of picture. Oh, good, yeah. So if you, if you accept one side of picture, means if you accept Bhagavatam, if you accept uh, all these things, then you have to accept that Krishna at once can marry 16,108 wives. And if you accept this, then all other things, all other pictures will be clear to you. And uh, also, we also discussed that in the uh, Bhagavad Gita 9.11, Krishna say that foolish consider him as a simple human being. So until unless one understand on that plane that uh, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita are transcendental and Krishna is not a person, then uh, they will not be able to understand all these transcendental <laughs> Can you just explain this again about the one side, they accept one side, they don't accept the other side? What is the one side and what is the other side? Uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada saying that uh, they are, uh, they, without considering that the Lord can at once marry 16,000 wives or more. So they, they are not considering that uh, Krishna can marry 16,108 uh, wives at once. No, but there's two sides of the picture, right? One side they accept, one side they don't. What side do they accept? They, they think Krishna as like themselves. Yes, right. And they, that's why they make uh, they they make own conclusions. Means that they consider that everything. Right. Everything. They're thinking Krishna is an ordinary person because they see Krishna in family life, mundane life. He has his wife. He has his house. And so they think Krishna is just like us. So they they accept him like that, but they don't accept. The other side, other side, 16,000 wives, not just one wife, 16,000 plus wives. So that's the other side. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Mahārāj.
Hare Krishna. Group number five, uh, six. Hare Krishna Maharaj, where it's also speaking on 37, 38 and 39, so some of the points are quite similar, but we'll just go over them. But yeah, please, go over them again. Point, first point is the Lord is transcendental, so his associates are also transcendental, they're part of his uh, internal potency. And the Lord has different relationships in the spiritual realm. And he brought all those relationships or, and his devotees to the material realm. So also the Lord is just playing, he, he is transcendental, but he's, but he's playing as a husband. He's playing, I think it's mentioned as a henpecked husband, but actually he's completely transcendental. Um, so who are these associates? Uh, his wives. Oh, 16,000? Um, I think so. Yeah. 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 They have 16,000, yeah, 108 wives, yeah. They're all, they're all part of his potency or internal potency. Um, also, it's described that um, Papa mentions in the purple that even the devotees do not know him perfectly well. So then he kind of chides the mental speculators. So what chance have you got? of understanding the position of the Lord. And he'll, he mentions that the Lord can only be known actually by his mercy alone. And then the Lord is, it's mentioned in the Shruti and Smriti that the Lord is not affected by Mahamaya. He's situated in, in, in Yoga Maya. He is near Guru, which means he has no material qualities. It's completely transcendental. And then finally, mentioned that the Yamaha Bhagavad devotees are transcendental what to speak of the Lord himself mm. <laughs> yeah thank you yeah so the Mahabhagavad devotees are transcendental certainly the Lord has nothing to do with the material energy he's above that but this, this is Leela and he's performing his pastimes with so many great devotees, pure souls who have also come from the spiritual world to take part in his pastimes. Okay, so let's just go back to the slideshow. We'll just finish this off. Huh? Yeah, Krishna's queens in Dwarka. Remember, they are expansions of his internal potency. And thus the potent, meaning Lord Krishna, and the potencies, the queens, are perpetually exchanging transcendental pleasures, known as pastimes of the Lord. And you can see in the picture some of the pastimes. Lord Krishna with his queens on the elephant, and the queens are all there receiving him. From the Chaitanya Bhagavat, it is stated in the Gopal Tapani Upanishad that the queens of Krishna are also related to him as belonging to the category of his Swarup Shakti. Therefore, in their position as Swarup Shakti, they are necessarily of the same position as Lakshmi. In other words, they are all goddesses of fortune. All 16,000 plots, they're all goddesses of fortune and they've come to take part in the Lord's pastimes. A further quote from 37, mental speculators compare everything from the standpoint. Thus when the Lord is found to act like an ordinary person in matrimonial bondage, they consider him to be like one of them without considering that the Lord can at once marry 16,000 wives or more. So, we may think, oh, Krishna is a henpecked husband, oh, he's in bondage, he's in maya, we call it the deep well, right? the dark well, the andakupam, greha andakupam, the well of family life, but Krishna is not like that. He's not like us. He's above that. He can marry 16,000 wives at once. Okay, so we spoke about this transcendental nature of Krishna's exchanges. 
a little quote here. He married only 16,000 wives and entered in each and every one of the different palaces just to impress in the history of the human beings on the surface of the earth that the Lord is never equal to or less than any human being, however powerful he may be. No one, therefore, is either equal to or greater than the Lord. The Lord is always great in all respects. God is great, is eternal truth. From the purport, text number 31, chapter 11. One more. When the Lord descends, he does so along with his entourage to display a complete picture of the transcendental world where pure love and devotion for the Lord prevail without any mundane image. Jai, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Any, any question, any comment from anyone? Anybody? Yes, Prabhu? I was just thinking about uh, with this connection with Narada Muni, which he enters into Varaka and went to the different palaces uh, of the Lord, and he saw different activities uh, which Krishna uh, had in these different palaces, and uh, how, the, how Narada Muni and he went to the first palace, he saw Krishna in one situation and uh, he praised the Lord that uh, he wanted to give him some benediction and he, he was praying that he can remember his, uh, him always. So, and then he enters in different other palaces and he, uh, in, and he see, saw a uh, lot in different other occupation duties in, uh, in uh, this process. So in this way, he was he realized that Krishna gave him the opportunity to remember these different pastimes. So, okay. So yes, that's nice. Narada Muni visiting Krishna in Dwarka. He saw the inconceivable opulence of Lord Krishna, performing different pastimes in different places with different wives. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. So, I, I talked, Padma Sundari asked me about the open book question for this unit. So, we selected text question number three, which is about mood and mission relating to Maharaj Yudhisthira, the beginning of chapter 10. All right? So, you want to be working on your essay, that's the topic. Pick some quotations about mood and mission from that section and discuss about ISKCON and how much we are fulfilling Prabhupada's desire for the mood and mission of ISKCON. Okay, so thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhus. Hare Krishna.